Hello, my name is Tonya Young Fadok. I'm the Chair of Colon and Rectal Surgery at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. One of the commonest problems that we deal with as colorectal surgeons is that of colon and rectal polyps. Many times when these are picked up on a screening colonoscopy, they can actually be dealt with and removed at that time. However, when polyps are large, they may be difficult to remove using a colonoscope, or they may already have a risk of containing a cancer within them. In that case, we have to perform surgery, both to take the polyp out and to reduce the risk of developing cancer. In the video you're about to see, a young gentleman presented with a very extensive uh, polyp in the rectum that essentially covered the lining of the rectum for a distance of over 10 centimeters. He required an operation to remove the rectum, but fortunately it was possible to reconstruct the intestinal continuity such that he did not need a permanent colostomy. When we do this operation, we do not do it as an open operation with a long incision up and down the middle of the abdomen, but we do this laparoscopically. An open operation generally means a stay of five to seven days in the hospital versus the three to four days that we see after a laparoscopic approach. Instead of a long incision, the patient will have a two inch incision around the navel and three small incisions in the lower abdomen. The shorter length of stay is thought to be because of the smaller incision and the reduced amount of pain that these patients have afterwards. Generally, after such an operation, patients are feeling more like themselves again about four to six weeks after surgery. The operation itself takes approximately three to four hours, depending on the complexity of the case and also the size of the patient. If you would like any more information about colon polyps or other colorectal diseases, please feel free to visit our Mayo Clinic website. Thank you. This video demonstrates a laparoscopic total mesorectal excision and colloanal anastomosis for a carpeting villus polyp of the rectum. The patient was a 38-year-old man. He presented with complaints of hematochesia and new onset of constipation. He had no family history of colon cancer or polyps. On endoscopy, he was found to have a circumferential villus polyp from the dentate line to approximately 20 centimeters above the anal verge. Biopsy showed tubulovillus adenoma without evidence of dysplasia or carcinoma. Immunohistochemical staining demonstrated normal DNA mismatch repair, and there was no evidence of microsatellite instability on further testing. This CT scan shows the bulky nature of the polyp within the rectum. Here is the arrangement of port sites, with the camera port being above the umbilicus. The procedure commences with mobilization of the left colon. This starts at the left pelvic brim alongside the sigmoid colon. The left lateral peritoneal reflection is opened, and the dissection proceeds in the correct retroperitoneal plane. The white line of tolt is left with the patient as the dissection proceeds. The left ureter is identified and protected. Dissection continues more proximally alongside the descending colon. This proceeds more proximally over gerotus fascia and the left kidney. Attention is then turned to the splenic flexure and the lateral dissection is continued around the splenic flexure in a retrograde fashion. The omentum is then elevated and the lesser sac is entered. The omentum can then be dissected off the distal transverse colon in order to complete the mobilization of the splenic flexure. Attention is then turned to the pelvis for the rectal dissection. After identifying the left ureter, which is in the bottom left of the screen, the left pararectal peritoneum is scored and the presacral space is entered. The dissection continues posteriorly and laterally. The correct presacral plane is a bloodless plane. The left hypogastric nerve is identified and protected. 
with the rectum retracted towards the right, further dissection of the left attachments can be performed. This then allows for further tension to be placed posteriorly as dissection proceeds towards the pelvic floor. And then again back to the left side of the rectum. Here, one can see the curve of the coccyx sweeping anteriorly as the posterior dissection proceeds. The tension is then turned to the right and the right ureter is identified. The rectum is retracted, cephalad and towards the left, allowing for tension on the right pararectal tissues. The right pararectal peritoneum is then scored and the presacral space entered, joining the dissection with that already performed from the left. Here one can see the previous dissection from the left and posteriorly as it's been joined with the right-sided dissection. The rectum is retracted anteriorly and laterally, again to put tension on the right-sided attachments. The intact nature of the mesorectum can be appreciated. Again, further dissection of the rectum can be performed, sweeping the rectum anteriorly. Once the posterior and bilateral dissection is performed, this then allows tension to be placed anteriorly and the peritoneal reflection is opened. The anterolateral attachments on the right are being divided and dissection proceeds laterally and anteriorly. During the anterior dissection, care is taken to avoid injury to the seminal vesicles. Careful retraction of the rectum out of the pelvis helps to maintain the exposure of the anterior dissection. Once the anterior dissection has been started, this allows for further tension to be placed laterally, again as further dissection continues towards the pelvic floor. Here the muscles of the pelvic floor can be seen contracting with the application of the cautery. The rectum is fully mobilized down to the level of the pelvic floor. Here the dense fibrous tissue posteriorly is divided to facilitate subsequent division with a laparoscopic articulated linear stapler. Before firing the stapler, digital exam confirms that there is no polyp distal to it. Care is taken to ensure that each staple line is within the apex of the previous staple line. The base of the inferior mesenteric artery is isolated. The vascular cartridge within the stapler is placed across the vessel, but before firing it, the left ureter is again identified in order to ensure it is protected and then the vessel is divided. Further division of the sigmoid mesentery is then performed to facilitate exteriorization. The specimen is then extracted through the periumbilical incision resected and a coloplasty pouch was created. The pneumoperitoneum is then re-established and the pelvis irrigated. 
the EEA stapler is inserted in the anus and the spike brought out adjacent to the staple line. The anvil of the stapler is then docked onto the handle and the cut edge of the mesentery is checked to ensure there is no twisting of the mesentery. Here the sutures of the coloplasty can be seen. The stapler is reapproximated and fired and then a loop of distal ileum is brought up to the abdominal wall to create an ileostomy. This is the specimen showing the intact mesorectal dissection. And this is the open specimen showing the very extensive nature of this carpeting polyp.